So hi everyone, welcome to our our astronomy on sorry our ast <laughs> not our astronomy on tap our Astro McGill event. Um, so, can everyone hear me at the back? Right. Cool. So uh, we'll start off with the draw for the Astro McGill T-shirt. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You've won a t-shirt. You want to come on down? Congratulations. <laughs> Here. You go around the, just around the mics. <laughs> okay, and then just before we get started, um, I'd like to advertise our upcoming uh, Astronomy on Tap event which will be held at McLean's Pub uh, next Tuesday, May 29th at 7 p.m. It will be a Mars special with two talks on ancient water on Mars, as well as some trivia and other games. And with that, we'll begin our talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Lauren Weiss, who is a Trottier uh, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal. Uh, Lauren studies small exoplanets, studying both individual planetary systems and patterns in broader exoplanet populations. She tests what, uh, which uh, physical processes shape the present-day orbital configurations and the compositional diversity of small exoplanets. Lauren received a PhD in astronomy at UC Berkeley in 2016, and she's soon off to Hawaii as the parent uh, postdoctoral fellow. And with that, let's welcome Lauren. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, am I on? Oh, okay. Yes, thank you all for coming. Um, I apologize that the weather was so good. I feel guilty for uh, having you all in here. Um, but I'll try to take our imaginations outside of this room. So I use planetary systems as laboratories for studying our cosmic origin. Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at the night sky, can we have lights off? <laughs> Don't trip over the cord this time. OK. That's better. When we look at the night sky, it's an inspiring view. And since the dawn of humanity, peoples from different cultures and different places have seen the night sky as a place of our origin. Many creation stories begin with the heavens, of which our Earth is but one part. So it is my privilege as an astronomer and as a scientist to participate in creating an evidence-based story of our origins. Who are we? How did we come to be here? on this strange, rocky planet. What other planets are out there? Are they like our own? And what does that mean about us and our place in the universe? So I'm not the only one who has asked these questions. Uh, since time immemorial, people have looked at the sky in wonder. And uh, all over the world, different societies noticed that there are some stars in the sky that don't behave like other stars. In Greek, the word for these stars was planets, which means wanderers. And these were uh, what appeared to be stars that wandered back and forth relative to the other stars in the firmament. This is an image of uh, some planets and stars over a castle not far from Barcelona, Spain. So can anyone identify this bright object in the sky? I hear both a right answer and a wrong answer. Mars is actually this little one right here. This is the moon. <laughs> it's the moon. If you uh, examine these planets, you might notice that there's a pattern to them, that they appear to make an arc in this image, spanning from Mercury to Jupiter. 
Now, of course, this is a, a panoramic image. So if you actually looked at the night sky, uh, this, what appears to be an arc, would actually be more of a straight line. And that is uh, something that ancient peoples noticed and called the plane of the sky where the planets orbit the ecliptic plane. So what do we know about our place in the universe given our observations of the motions of our own planets from our own solar system as a laboratory. Well, back uh, around uh, the turn of the millennium, Ptolemy was an ancient astronomer in, uh, in the Greek tradition who made a geocentric model of the universe. That is with Earth at the center, uh, surrounded by an orbit of the moon and uh, the sun and Mercury and Venus and Mars all the way out culminating with a celestial sphere, which he imagined as a glass sphere uh, fixed in space with the stars uh, imprinted on it. Now, um, we've come a long way since that time. In the, uh, in the 16th century, Copernicus had a, a really brilliant idea, which was, oh, what if the Earth is not the center of the universe, but rather the sun is? So this image is showing a Copernican heliocentric model with the sun at the center and different planets going out and out. You can see the Earth here, and in the Copernican model, the moon orbits the Earth. So this is quite familiar to us. Another great astronomer, Galileo, observed Jupiter with a small telescope. And if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope yourself, you can look at Jupiter in the night sky and see this image. So Galileo saw Jupiter and these nearby objects that he called stars, and he recorded night after night the position of Jupiter and its neighboring stars. And notice that these starry bodies changed in their position very quickly, indeed as if they were orbiting Jupiter. We now know that these objects are not stars, they are moons that orbit Jupiter. And if you look back at this uh, Copernican image of the universe, indeed, there are four little bodies here in orbit around Jupiter. But the father of modern astronomy is considered to be Johannes Kepler. Kepler worked with some very detailed observations of the positions of our planets in the night sky. This is a, an actual table out of a book that he published that shows uh, over time what were the positions in the sky of the different planets that he could see. And he discovered a fundamental physical law, which is that the closer a planet is to the star, the faster it has to move to maintain its orbit. And it wasn't uh, until a little bit later that Sir Isaac Newton discovered that the fundamental law uh, describing the motion of all of these celestial bodies is the law of gravity, which is one of the fundamental forces in the universe. So thanks to astronomy and our study of the solar system as a laboratory, we know about gravity. So what is our picture of the solar system today? Well, we have the sun and uh, a variety of terrestrial planets, gas giants and ice giants. Uh, these are the planets in order from the sun. Of course, this is just an artist's portrait. This is not actually a, a photograph. So what do we know about these individual planets that were just spots of light in Galileo's telescope? Well, the way we know about them is primarily from sending probes to the planets. These are images of some terrestrial worlds, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, from various spacecrafts that visited them. You'll notice that the image from Venus is pretty old, 1979, and that's because the most recent mission to Venus was in 1983. We haven't gone back there since then. This is Jupiter, as imaged in the ongoing Juno mission. Juno is at this moment circling Jupiter, measuring its gravitational field and taking images of the planet. Before Jupiter's arrival, before Juno's arrival at Jupiter uh, in the past couple years, we did not know that Jupiter was blue at the poles, but we know this now thanks to Juno's visit. This is Saturn. 
Can anyone identify where the sun is in this picture? It's behind Saturn, that's right. So this is Saturn in silhouette from the Cassini mission. This is Uranus and Neptune. I cheated a little bit, and actually for the image of Uranus, this is from a ground-based telescope, the Keck telescope, which I will talk about more later. Uh, but then this is Neptune as imaged by Voyager 2. And again, the last time a mission visited Neptune was in 1989, two years after I was born. So it might be time to go back. Of course, last but uh, not least is Pluto. You might consider it a planet, you might not consider it a planet, I really don't care. This, uh, this is what Pluto looks like. The New Horizons probe flew by it at very high speed in 2015 and captured a suite of amazing photographs of, of which this is uh, one mosaic. There's this heart-shaped feature, the Sputnik planum, um, and all sorts of other wonderful features. Mountains made of ice, uh, there are active tectonics on Pluto, so it's a wonderful world in its own right, whether or not you want to call it a planet. Of course, Pluto also has a very large moon, Charon, which was also imaged by the New Horizons flyby. And finally, here is our own planet, Earth, as seen from the Apollo 8 mission, the very first mission in which human beings orbited the moon. They were flying in their spacecraft over the moon and saw the Earth rising. So captured this photograph. This is called Earthrise, and it is from uh, 19, I think 1960, uh, I think 1968, I'll have to double check the year. But uh, this is, a, I think, a really stunning image. It personally moves me to look back at our own world and see what it looks like from space. More recently, uh, this image was taken. Does anyone know which planet is here? This is Earth. This is the famous pale blue dot image captured by uh, the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, it was uh, a clever idea to point it back in, at Earth from the distant regions of the solar system and see just how small we are when viewed from space. And Carl Sagan likened this to a, a pale blue dot, a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. So that's uh, really deep and beautiful, but also troubling. If this is how small our own Earth looks from the edge of our solar system, what hope do we have of finding worlds like this around distant stars? When we look up at the night sky, we wonder and we hope that there are other planets there, but how will we find them? So today I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to be the ones to discover exoplanets. And so we're going to imagine a scenario in which I and all of the other astronomers in this room and on planet Earth are wiped out by an asteroid. And the rest of you, uh, get a chance to start over and figure out where are the other worlds, what are they like, and to use them as laboratories for studying our origins. So how would you do it? How will you find another planet, yes? <laughs> oh, um, uh, let, let's say all of our, our, our publications get destroyed too. You have to figure it out again. <laughs> Any other ideas? Yeah? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's say you've still got some telescopes lying around that you can use. Okay, see how the light from a star changes over time. Why, why might that be useful, do you think? Because when the planet is in front of the star, you see less light. 
Awesome. This is true. It's something that we've verified right here on Earth. So does anyone know what this image is? Close. It's, v it's Venus. This is the transit of Venus in 2012. This is a, a composite image from different times as Venus marches across the face of the sun. And indeed, uh, during Venus's passage, it's blocking some sunlight. So that might change the brightness of the sun. So now we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to use my webcam as a telescope. This is, this is our telescope. I've pointed it conveniently at a star. And I'm going to need a volunteer. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Nice to meet you, Emily. All right, so Emily is going to play God. Um, or the laws of physics, you're actually just gonna play Kepler's third law. You don't have to play God. So it's a slightly, not quite as tall in order. So Emily, this is your star, and you get to choose a planet to orbit the star. Um, we, you'll see, just choose, just choose whichever one strikes your fancy. Okay, this one. So Emily, um, if you come just in front of the table but stop there, that's perfect, just so that you can reach your planet around the star. It might help to turn your hand over, um, all the way over. So you wanna go all the way around the star, yeah. And so look in the telescope, look in our webcam and see is your planet actually crossing in front of the star. What do you think? Good? All right, so Emily, you can just keep on making your planet orbit by Kepler's laws of motion. And um, I'm going to stand in for the astronomers in the room, the new astronomers, and capture some data. So this graph is measuring the brightness of the star over time. So you can see in real time, <laughs> what's the brightness of the star? <laughs> Very good. All right, nice job, Emily. Can we thank Emily? Okay, so what, what do we notice about uh, these data that you got? It repeats, there's a pattern. We can even maybe make a prediction about what the data is going to look like. So what do you think would happen if we had a planet that was orbiting a bit slower than Emily's planet? Yeah, should we, should we test that? Can I get another volunteer? Yeah, come on down. What's your name? Omar, Omar nice to meet you. Can I be? You can be whatever planet you want to be. All right. <laughs> okay. So let's, um, I'll let you get set up. So practice moving Jupiter around the star. See if you can get some good transits. All right. So we've got a different planet here. It might orbit at a, it might orbit at a different speed from Emily's, but it's also a different size from Emily's planet. So um, I want you all to make a prediction. Will the drops in light be bigger or smaller? All right, let's find out. <laughs> I know, physics is hard. 
<laughs> All right, thank you, Omar. Okay, so we have here a laboratory. Um, what's really cool about this is, I mean, I would love to actually go to other stars and, you know, play Kepler and, and make the planets move how I want them to move, uh, but I don't get to do that for my job. Uh, but, we, but we here have a, a little laboratory exercise. So if there are any experiments that you want to try that might mimic something in the universe, um, can anyone suggest another experiment that they would like to try. You wanna try it? Come on, do it. <laughs> What's your name? George. George? Nice, nice to meet you. Okay, so George is gonna orbit his iPhone. Yeah, like a, an alien, an alien megastructure, maybe. <laughs> okay, you ready? All right, you're on. <laughs> I don't know if it's following all of Kepler's laws. Um, all right, thanks, George. All right, well, so hang on, before you go, wait, before you go, um, so, so what did you think would happen with your iPhone? I ask you after you got the data. Make, make a prediction. <laughs> Okay, so, so audience, um, what do you think? Can you tell that this was an iPhone and not a round planet, just from the data? No, I, I totally can't tell either. Yeah, so that's something interesting we learned, is the shape of the planet doesn't really matter that much. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's that could be part of why um, that could be part of why this particular object did not have the same depth of transit every single time. Maybe it is a a flat alien megastructure fluctuating. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna make a bet with you. I bet that the audience is actually gonna be really good at predicting when planets transit and how deep they are with a steady hand. So I'm gonna do it. And audience, what I want you to do is I'm gonna try to have a really rhythmic orbit and I want you to tell me when the planet is gonna transit. Oops, let's aim the camera first. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna pick a medium-sized planet just to be a little different. And let's try to get this going. Is that not going? Okay, uh, let's just try to restart that. Okay. All right. Is 
So audience, make your predictions. Tell me when's the next one gonna be. Yeah, so actually with a steady orbit that's not a human orbit, but something following the laws of physics, you can make predictions about when planets are gonna transit. And um, aside from some um, very large shape in the universe occulting the star at the beginning of our observations, uh, the depth was fairly consistent, at least as well as we can do with this um, imperfect laboratory setup. Yeah, question? Mm -hmm. Planets that are... All right. I want you to come do an experiment. <laughs> Thanks, George. <laughs> What's your name? Boris. Boris. Oh, great. Um, all right. So, Boris, Boris's idea is, well, what about a planet that's very far away? So far, we've had all of our planets, like, orbiting the star really close. Now, I don't really want you to actually run around the star, mostly because we've already had one wipeout on the power cord. But what we can do to simulate what you're concerned about, like, do planets that are far away from the star transit, is... We're going to aim the camera, and why don't you come up here so a little bit closer and put the planet in front of the star relative to the webcam. So you'll need to look at it. You might need to like take another step forward or something. But you want your planet far from the star, right? That's what you wanted to test. But you have to have it in the webcam. Well, I want you to stand, uh, I guess, cl closer to me. Okay. There you go and put the planet so it covers the light. You can do it. Oh. All right. Here, bring your elbow in. There we go. Something like that. And you can move the planet so that it goes in front of the star, right? Not your hand in front of the star, just the planet. Okay. Yeah, it's not easy. So do you think you've answered your question? I, I guess I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> so we can, we can capture some data just for fun. Um, see, see if we can get that planet in front of the star. There you go. You got something in front of the star. That might have been your hand. <laughs> that looks more like a planet. So what we're learning from this is that it's, there are fewer possible alignments when a planet is far from the star that result in a transit. In fact, the transit probability is expressed as the uh, size of the star, the radius of the star, divided by the distance between the star and the planet. So the farther the planet is from the star, the less likely it is to transit. And that's actually gonna be really important when we start to talk about finding planets like Earth. All right, thanks, Boris. <laughs> Applause for Boris. Okay. Oh, um, yes, what would you like to try? What's, hi, what's your name? Nice to meet you, Catherine. All right, Catherine, can you, can you explain to us what you wanna try? Here, you have, to, you have to explain it first so they can make a prediction. It's not going to happen in nature. Um, what if it, like Pluto, it was too rocky body? If it was big enough, it would walk in orbit. Okay. So the distance would be short. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so you want a, a planet with a moon going around it and the whole thing going around the star. You, some people call Pluto and Charon a, a binary dwarf planet or whatever. Some people call Earth and our moon a binary planet too. Yeah, so, oops. Uh, okay, so you can try that and maybe if you just, yeah, it's tricky. 
but they're all, they also have to orbit each other. Because that's what a moon does. Oh, but they have to follow Kepler's law. So the speed of their orbit is based on what they're orbiting around and uh, yeah, and their distance. Yeah, I, I would also be happy to help you. I can, I, can do, I can move one of them and you can move the other. I'd be willing to do that. All right, let's give ourselves 30 seconds because this one's complicated. Okay, so which one am I? Okay, I'll be this one. Okay. Okay, cool. So you can just, you can hold that there and I'm gonna capture data and then I'll just try to orbit this around you, or around your planet while we move. Okay, ready, go. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up till we get over here. I don't know if that's working. Oh, this is, this is terrible, we're not lined up at all. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, let's let's give it another shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine, for that uh, thought experiment. <laughs> so. Um, so indeed, um, th this is maybe not super representative because we struggled to simulate what we were trying to simulate. Um, but indeed, people are looking for moons around exoplanets by looking for um, patterns and deviations in how long it takes uh, the planet to, to transit and whether there are additional transits that tend to happen right before or right after, which would be the signature of the moon. Indeed, you can see that whenever there was a, whenever there was one transit, there was often sort of another little bump or something going on. So uh, that could be the sign of an exomoon. Maybe it's just noisy data in this case, uh, or just you know not obeying the laws of physics as we were. But the point is, you can concoct whatever scenario you scenario you want and test what that would look like. So what we've learned so far is that the time between the transits is the orbital period of a planet and that the light blocked by the planet is of course the cross-sectional area of the planet and that corresponds to how deep the transit is. Okay. So there was a mission recently that took advantage of this transit method to find thousands of other worlds. This mission is called Kepler, and it launched in 2009. Kepler was designed to study the statistics of exoplanets and was capable of finding Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits, planets that would very, very rarely make tiny, tiny dip in the starlight. Kepler stared at 150,000 stars for four years. So this is the Kepler field, the, the patch of sky that Kepler looked at. And to orient you, this is the Milky Way. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the summer sky, here are Vega, Deneb, and Altair, an asterism called the Summer Triangle. So later tonight, when you go outside, it's a beautiful clear night, if you look up, you might see three bright stars that make a really big right triangle in the sky. And that's very close to where this Kepler spacecraft searched for planets. Here is one planet, uh, actually two planets that Kepler discovered. This is Kepler 10, a star with two small planets. So this is the relative intensity of starlight that Kepler measured over time very similar to the curves we were just making with our laboratory setup. And you can see these dips in the light curve. Now, there's uh, some blue dotted lines that are identifying transits of one planet, and then this yellow box has a zoom down here, and you can see individual transits from another planet highlighted with the red dashed line. So it's sort of hard to see from these individual transits what the depths of the transits are and what their shapes are. So what we do is because the transits repeat over and over, we just stack up the light from all of the transits on top of each other. 
So here are the, uh, the basic shapes of the two transits. The, the, this is just the light curve folded at the period of the planets. So this uh, planet on top, this is the, the faster orbiting planet, the closer in planet. And the blue one is uh, from, the, from the blue line before. And you can see the scale on the y-axis. This is the relative intensity of the star. How much did the starlight dim? When we were doing our little experiment with, with um, styrofoam balls, we would dim the star by like 50% or whatever. But here, uh, this is 0.999. So the, uh, if the light changed from here to here, that's a dimming of 0.1% but the star dimmed by much, much less than 0.1%. So these planets are barely blocking any starlight at all. And that's, of course, what makes them hard to find, but that means that they're small. And actually, the size of this planet on top is about one and a half times the size of Earth, and this one is about two and a half times the size of Earth. So uh, these planets were pretty close to their stars. Um, Kepler found a lot of planets orbiting various stars. Uh, here's a diagram showing the sizes of some of the stars and then uh, the corresponding shadows that we, uh, that correspond to the planets around those stars. And we can use the transits to identify the radii and periods of Kepler's planets. This plot is showing the size of the planet compared to Earth. So Jupiter is up here. Neptune is here, and Earth is this size, and this is orbital period. Uh, our own Earth orbits the Sun in 365 days, so that puts it about here. And Kepler found pretty much all of these planets, all of these blue and yellow dots correspond to planets that Kepler discovered. So as you can see, Kepler found lots and lots of small planets. But many of them are quite close to their stars. As we discovered in Boris's experiment, it's very rare for small planets to transit. And as we discovered through our other experiments, uh, the, the small planets make just a tiny dip in the light. It's harder to identify. So did we find any Earths with Kepler? Maybe not any true Earth analogs, but we can play some, uh, some really clever games with statistics. So this is uh, my colleague, Eric Pettigura. We shared an advisor in grad school. And he asked the question, how rare is the Earth? So when a planet transits the star, a lot of the time there's a, a very easily identifiable dip in the light and the planet is detected. But sometimes, as we discovered, the planet doesn't quite transit the star and then the brightness of the star doesn't change at all. So you miss that planet. You can also miss a planet when it does transit the star, but when your data are too noisy to clearly identify the dip in the starlight. So what Eric did is a very clever scheme of basically simulating, but on a, on a computer instead of with a little light bulb, what kinds of planets he could detect in transit at different sizes and different orbital periods. And at each size and period, he would count how many planets did he find, how many planets got missed. And so what he discovered from this study is that one in five sun-like stars has an Earth-like planet, by which he meant a, a planet between one and two times the size of Earth that uh, was within a factor of two of our orbital period uh, around the sun. So when you look at the night sky, the next time you're outside and look at all of these stars. You can just look at five stars and make a pretty good bet that one of them probably has a planet about the size of Earth at a temperature that might be suitable for liquid water. All right, so, um, so I, I took a different approach to, uh, to this wonderful data set from Kepler, which is that as we saw from Kepler, there are lots and lots of small planets, but we don't actually know what they're made of. In our own solar system, we have Earth and we have the ice giant Neptune, but we have no planets of intermediate sizes. Yet, these intermediate sized planets are the most common planets in the galaxy that we know of so far. 
So what are they made of? And are they rocky like Earth? Or do they have thick layers of hydrogen gas like Neptune? To study the compositions of planets, it's important to measure their masses. So I actually uh, use a telescope here on Earth to do that work. This is Mauna Kea. Uh, this is on the big island of Hawaii. As Taylor said, I'm moving to Hawaii soon so I can use this mountain more. And this photograph is from the International Space Station. So from space, you can see a little ring of white here. These are uh, some telescopes on top of Mauna Kea, sitting at 14,000 feet on this dormant volcano. Here's the telescope I use. This is uh, the pair of Keck telescopes. And uh, what we do as astronomers is sit in a room uh, with no windows to the sky and look at computers that have images uh, from the, the instruments attached to the back end of our telescopes. So what am I looking for with this telescope? Well, what I'm trying to measure is the wobble of the star caused by the planet. So we didn't talk about Newton much yet, but uh, one of Newton's laws is that a, an object in rest stays at rest, um, et cetera. And also, um, obje uh, objects uh, always will uh, will only move uh, when there's a force applied to them. So we often think about a star as being the center of the solar system. But in reality, the star pulls on the planet and the planet also pulls on the star. So the star and planet are both orbiting a different point, the center of mass of the solar system, or as we call it, the Berry Center. So what this means is that as the planet makes its orbit, the star is making a smaller version of the exact same orbit. And if we can detect the star moving, well, and we can know something about the planet. So what I'm looking for is the Doppler shift of the star. Now, uh, if you've watched the Big Bang Theory, you might know that Sheldon tries to be the Doppler shift for Halloween and nobody gets his costume. Um, so what the Doppler shift is, uh, is when you have a wave and you compress it or stretch it, the frequency of the wave changes. So that manifests, for example, uh, with ambulances and sirens that pass by you. When the ambulance is approaching you, the pitch is a little bit higher. And then it passes you and it drops. So you hear <laughs> as the ambulance goes by. And that's not because uh, the pitch of the siren is intrinsically changing on the ambulance, that's because uh, just when something is moving toward you versus away from you, it has a different pitch. So that's true with sound waves, it's also true of light waves, and uh, so when a star is moving toward you, the light waves get a bit compressed, which uh, in terms of uh, frequency of light waves means they get slightly blue shifted. When the star moves away from you, the waves get a little bit red shifted. So what exactly are we looking for? This is a spectrum of the sun, and it's color-coded as you would expect. What are these big black things? Well, these are absorption bands from chemical elements at the surface of the sun, sodium, iron, potassium, uh, all sorts of great elements. And what we can do is we can actually measure how these lines shift over time. So we might get a spectrum of a star that looks like this on one night, and then maybe the next night it looks kind of like that. Now, I have totally exaggerated this motion so that you can actually see something. In reality, these lines move by less than a pixel, and it's only because there are so many lines that we get to model that we can use statistics to figure out uh, exactly how much these lines are shifting and what velocity of the star that shift corresponds to. So what we're looking for is that the time it takes these lines to wobble is equal to the orbital period of the planet, and the amplitude of the wobble is the mass of the planet. So uh, we take that beautiful, beautiful spectrum, that data-rich spectrum, and just take one point per night that represents the velocity of that spectrum. And we do this over many nights to get 
a, basically a sine wave from the orbit of the planet. And again, the time between peaks, that's the orbital period of the planet, and the amplitude is the mass. So this is what uh, Jupiter would look like as observed going around the star, uh, going around our sun. So the reason that we want to get planet masses is, well, we know the sizes of the planets from their transits. So, and if we get their masses, we can divide mass by volume to calculate the density of these planets and figure out what is inside of these other worlds. What kind of compositions do they have? So I did this for Kepler-10. That was the uh, system that I mentioned earlier. So these are real data for Kepler-10. These are the velocity, this is the velocity of the star uh, comprised from the motion of each planet because they're two different planets. So uh, one thing you might notice about this compared to the graph I just showed you is the data uh, looks a lot noisier. That's because these are small planets. They are low mass planets and they uh, don't move the star as much. So that makes it a lot harder to measure their masses. But with over 200 measurements of the star's spectrum, we were able to measure the masses of these planets and determine that the smaller planet is rocky and the bigger planet has a gaseous hydrogen helium envelope. So we actually went a, a step further and found a fundamental law, well I shouldn't say a fundamental law, it's not really like a law of physics, just a fundamental observation about planets in the galaxy. Uh, we weren't expecting to find this, it was an accident. Uh, but we wanted to know in general what are the sizes and, and compositions of the Kepler planets. So what I'm showing here is planet density on the y-axis and planet size on the x-axis. To help you out, I also scaled a few solar system objects to the, like, to scale, to the size scale. So you can see our terrestrial worlds over here. Uh, this is Uranus, it's a lot bigger. So where are the exoplanets? Well, they all have sizes that are sort of intermediate. And uh, if you look at just the Kepler-10 exoplanets, here's Kepler-10b. Uh, in line with the other rocky planets, and here's Kepler 10c. And indeed, when you do this for uh, 100 exoplanets, you can see that there's a broad pattern to the data, where planets that are smaller than one and a half Earth radii are consistent with being on this line that describes our terrestrial worlds. But planets larger than this size have lower densities. Now, the only way to explain what we see is that, well, th this part's actually like pretty easy to understand. It's just that uh, when you add more rock on top of rock, the rock compresses a little bit. So as exoplanets that are rocky get bigger, uh, they, they also get denser because of the compression of rock. But the only way that the density of planets could fall with increasing size is because gas is added to them. So what we discovered is that we just observe across hundreds of exoplanets that there's this transition in the compositions of planets at about one and a half Earth radii. So we observed that planets larger than about one and a half times the size of the Earth are usually not rocky. So what this means is when you're looking at the night sky and you want to find another Earth, you don't really want to focus your energy on these. Or maybe you do if you want to study more of what gases are they made of, what are they like, how did they form, why are they different from the planets in our solar system. But the rocky planets are smaller than one and a half Earth radii. So um, in just the past uh, year, my teammates and I conducted the California Kepler survey. You probably noticed that uh, the the depth of the transit is related to how much starlight the planet blocks. So to understand the size of the planet, you actually have to know how big the star is. How do we know how big stars are? Uh, we can actually take observations of the spectra of stars and um, basically fit models to them to figure out how big the stars are. So my team and I spent uh, three years sleeplessly measuring the sizes of stars uh, that host planets. We studied 
over 1,000 stars with over 2,000 planets around them. And what did we find? Well, before we did the survey, if you just counted up the number of planets of different planet sizes, well, we knew that there were a lot more small planets than big planets. Okay, that's, that's nice, that's good to know. Lots of small planets out there. But with these new stellar sizes, my colleague BJ Fulton discovered that there's a gap in the distribution of small planet sizes. Planets that are smaller than one and a half Earth radii are fairly common, as are planets about larger than about two Earth radii. But planets of intermediate sizes between these small planet sizes are relatively rare. So what does this mean? Well, this gap just happens to line up with the peak in the density radius diagram I just showed you, that transition from rocky planets to planets with gaseous envelopes. So we've discovered two, uh, a new member of the exoplanet family tree. Here's what we think happens. We think planets form in a, a disk around the star, a protoplanetary disk. Some planets accrete enough gas to become giant planets, but then some planets never do. They're too small. But among those small planets, there are two families. The super-Earths are one family, and the mini-Neptunes are another family of small planets that have the gaseous envelopes. So how did this happen? How did these two different branches of the family tree emerge? What we think happens is that planets form out of rocky building blocks that assemble rocky cores. And the rocky cores can be a variety of masses and sizes. Those rocky cores then accrete gas from the nebula and form young planets. But the star, which um, emits more energy when it is young, is easily able to remove gas from the planets. The star is more effective at removing gas from the smaller and lower mass planets, which are less able to hold onto their atmospheres. But the larger planets retain their envelopes. And so this is how we get the mini Neptunes that have retained their envelopes and super-Earths, which probably used to have envelopes that have since been evaporated. Now, these super-Earths that we found with Kepler are all much closer to their stars than our own Earth is to the Sun. So it's not clear if our Earth formed the same way as Kepler's super-Earths, or if our own formation story is different. Uh, last, I want to talk about multi-planet systems. So, so far we've just been talking about the demographics of all planets, but the title of this talk is Planetary Systems as Laboratories. And indeed, research trends are moving toward using whole planetary systems to study the physics of planet formation. So this animation um, is just a, a cartoon. <laughs> This is showing uh, some of the multi-planet systems that Kepler discovered. And the orbits are all drawn to scale. Our own solar system's terrestrial planets are here. And you can see that all of these Kepler multi-planet systems have multiple planets, uh, but that it are, tend to be in orbits much smaller than, say, the orbit of Mars. The speeds of the planets are also scaled appropriately to Kepler's laws of physics. So here we get to zoom in because some of these systems um, have very compact architectures with planets extremely close to their stars. Of course, our solar system's innermost planet is Mercury with a period of 88 days. But most of these planets orbit their stars in about three to 30 days. So they're quite close and there are many of them. Pretty great. All right, so I want to use these systems as laboratories to figure out how planetary systems form in general and how our own solar system formed. With that goal in mind, I have studied the multi-planet systems 
from the California Kepler survey, which include 909 planets that transit 355 stars. So here are some uh, cartoons of the planets I've found. The star in each system is on the left, and each row is a unique planetary system with multiple planets. I've drawn the planets to scale so that the size of each dot corresponds to the true radius of the planet, and also the spacing between the planets is accurately represented. So I'm going, what I ask myself and what I'll ask you is, do you see any patterns here? Small ones are closer to the stars. Yeah, some, sometimes, like these ones are pretty close to the star. Um, yeah, sometimes the big ones are, do, t do seem like they're further out. Um, they kind of group together. What do you mean by that? Mm hmm yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some stars have only small ones and some stars have only big ones. So the way I phrased it is that planets in the same system often have similar sizes. So I've, I've highlighted a few examples. Here is a, a star system with four little planets. Here's another star system with four slightly bigger planets. Here again are some big planets, some big ones, some small ones. So what I learned from this study, which I had to validate statistically, but it was really honestly just based on doing this same exercise we all just did, is that, um, that the size of one planet in a planetary system is actually a very good predictor of the sizes of other planets in that same system. And that was something that we did not know before the Kepler mission and before we collected these data about planet and stellar sizes from the California Kepler survey. So what does this mean about us? Well, in our solar system, the planets are not all the same size, that's for sure. Um, but it's a little bit hard to compare our solar system to Kepler. All, almost, all of the Kepler planets we found have orbits shorter than the orbit of Mars. So we didn't find Jupiters and Saturns and Uranuses and Neptunes with Kepler. Also, we struggled to find planets as small as Mercury and Mars. So maybe with Kepler, we would have been sensitive to Venus and Earth, which indeed are actually almost the exact same size. So one way to think about this is that our solar system is different in the sense that, um, you know, that our, we have such size diversity and uh, if there were more size diversity in the, in the Kepler planetary systems, we could have discovered it at this point. We could have discovered some more size diversity than what we saw. On the other hand, you know, it's possible that an alien using their own Kepler mission to look at our solar system might have just seen Earth and Venus and uh, concluded that planets in the solar system tend to be the same size. Uh, but this is an intriguing clue, at least, that so many solar systems uh, have planets that are all the same sizes. So there's something about how planets form around their stars that tells planets how big to be. And they tend to know to all grow to that same size. And we do not yet understand what laws of physics those are. So that's an area of active research. Um, I'm gonna conclude by talking a little bit about experiments of the future. So I've talked about um, the history of our solar system as a laboratory. I've talked about sort of ongoing research with the Kepler mission, but there's a lot that's coming up. So um, in particular, actually something going on right now is that Kepler, um, as some of you know, um, had a, a miniature death. Uh, it had four reaction wheels of which it needed three to stably point at that beautiful Kepler field over the Milky Way. And two of its reaction wheels died. So it was not able to keep pointing at one spot in the sky, or so we thought, until a very clever engineer decided to use the solar 
uh, panels of Kepler as a third stabilizing axis. So Kepler now uses its solar sails plus two reaction wheels. And what this means is it can only look at stars on the ecliptic plane. So it has a very limited region of the sky that it can study, but it has continued marching along the ecliptic plane, studying different uh, patches of the sky. And one thing this uh, gave the community an opportunity to do was to study young stars. So my colleague Trevor David actually discovered a planet around a very young star, K233, which is only 5 million years old. Uh, for perspective, our sun is 5 billion years old. So uh, this star is only 1 1,000th the age of the sun. So if I'm like kind of a middle-aged person, um, roughly speaking, Right, uh, someone 1,000th of my age is an, an infant, someone that was just born. So this star is a, a newborn star, brand new, and it has a Neptune-sized planet in a, a short orbital period, very similar to some of the planets we discovered in the primary Kepler mission. So what this means is however those uh, Neptune-sized planets get close to their stars, well, they do it within the first five million years sometimes. So this is a wonderful clue about how planets form. Of course, uh, sort of the next great planet hunting mission is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This launched uh, in April this year, and it was launched by SpaceX. Um, it was the, certainly the first exoplanet mission launched by SpaceX. It was a, a fabulous launch. Did, I, did any of you watch it? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty sweet. Um, so what is TESS? This is an all-sky survey. So Kepler only looked at one tiny patch of the sky, but TESS is actually studying the whole sky. So it will look at large swaths of the sky for a month at a time before switching um, its field to different patches of sky. And over the course of two years, it will survey the entire sky for transiting planets. And the purpose of this is that Kepler, of course, found some Earth-sized planets, but they're all very far away. Uh, if we are here at the center of the circle, the Kepler planets are out uh, between sort of 400 and 1,000 light years, which makes it very difficult for us to study them further. But TESS will specialize at finding planets around very nearby stars, which we can then follow up with telescopes like the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea and many others to study their compositions, their atmospheres, and, and search for more planets. Just two days ago, this image came out. This is the very first image from TESS. And in it, you can see, uh, this is actually, this is the southern sky. TESS is pointing in the south first. And this is um, a part of the Milky Way, very rich with stars. So TESS is actively looking at all of these stars, just waiting for them to dim from real planets. Um, in the next few years, the James Webb Space Telescope will launch, and that will help us measure the compositions of exoplanet atmospheres. So that's coming up in May 2020. Um, I've optimistically put an exclamation point here, but um, when I was in high school, or when I was in middle school actually, this telescope was supposed to launch before my high school graduation, and now I have a PhD. So fingers crossed it actually launches soon. Um, so actually one of the telescopes I'm the most excited about is called the 30 meter telescope. It's an international collaborative project with six different institutions and countries participating. Canada is actually one of the participants in the 30 meter telescope. And we hope to build this and get it running sometime in like the late 2020s or early 2030s. So this will be a telescope with a 30 meter diameter mirror that will be able to uh, see fainter objects farther away in the universe than we ever have done before. To give you an idea of what the 30 meter telescope will do, uh, this is an image not from the 30 meter telescope, but from my beloved Keck telescope on Mauna Kea. So this is uh, a planetary system, one of only a handful of systems for which we have directly observed light from exoplanets. So these are multiple very large planets that are all uh, orbiting a, a massive star. Each of these planets is maybe about 10 or 15 times the mass of Jupiter. So they're huge planets. 
still wonderful, still wonderful to study, beautiful to see that we are actually seeing light from other planets. But what I really look forward to is something like this. This is a simulation of what the 30 meter telescope would be able to see if it were built at uh, our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri. So if, our, if this telescope were built 4.3 light years away and pointed back toward our sun, it would see this is, uh, this is light from the sun, interference patterns, airy rings from our own sun. But then this dot here is Venus. And this one is the Earth, Jupiter, and Mars is here. Maybe we would detect it, maybe not. But to me, this gives me hope that perhaps we will actually be able to image uh, not just our own pale blue dot of an Earth, but pale, faint, distant dots of other worlds. So when I look at the night sky, um, I am full of hope that we can see other worlds soon and learn more about where we come from and find meaning in this view. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so we have time for a few questions. You are even if every planet, every star out there has a planet around it, most of the planets, based on our own model, uh, are orbiting every two or three hundred years. If you are watching a star for only one month, mm. what are the chances of finding a system like our Earth? Well that's right. If you're looking for if you're looking for Pluto with its, you know, two hundred year orbit, um, that's longer than Taylor will spend getting his PhD. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, I have a couple, a couple of thoughts. So first of all, um, I'm not claiming that Earth is rare, and no one has actually claimed that Earth is rare. Uh, what I said is that Earth-like uh, Earth planets are probably around about one in five sun-like stars, based on the small planets at various distances from their stars that we've detected from Kepler. So it's actually not very much of an extrapolation to go from small planets at 100 days to small planets at 300 days. Um, so we actually are finding planets that are indeed not as far out as, say, Neptune or, or even Mars at this point necessarily with transits. But uh, we also understand our, um, our detection biases and can correct for them. That's part of what Eric did in his study, was count for the planets that we were missing from our own insensitivity in our detections. But it gets better than that. There's another technique called microlensing that I didn't talk about tonight that is actually very sensitive to small planets that are distant from their stars. And there's an upcoming mission called WFIRST that will survey the galactic center and actually look for, for planets uh, around, around stars there at a variety of orbital distances and masses. And it will be very, very sensitive to these small planets. So that will help us understand truly how rare the Earth is. Well, 
Well, it's not a small selection and it's actually unbiased. The whole point of the Kepler survey was it was a statistical mission. You're right that it's limited in its scope. It was not finding Pluto analogs. We instead found over 4,000 small planets that are very close to their stars. But what we learned from that is that about half of all stars in the galaxy have one of these sub-Neptune sized planets. So this isn't, you know, we aren't studying the oddballs. We aren't studying some weird small fraction of planetary systems that might not be representative. These systems are representative of what's out there. Our solar system we've learned now is relatively rare. Maybe it's um, maybe one in five stars is like the solar system. Maybe it's more like one in 10, um, but it's not one in two. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll just move to another. If, if, that were the, if that were the case, we would not have found 4,000 planets with Kepler. Okay, other questions? That's right. So Kep if, um, if aliens around Alpha Centauri had built uh, Kepler or Tess, they would be able to find Venus and maybe Earth. Uh, they probably wouldn't find Jupiter just because Jupiter has a long orbital period. Jupiter's orbital period is um, over 11 years. So Kepler only lasted for four years. So you'd, you'd have to be lucky to see tr Jupiter transit just once during the Kepler mission. And then as you say, planets like Mercury are a little bit too small and often get lost in the noise. So that's, that's part of the explanation. Um, so actually the work that I did was, um, I actually did a, a statistical analysis where I tested that hypothesis. What if, it turns out that our detection sensitivity is the reason behind this pattern. And so I actually set up a scenario where I let the planet sizes around each star be random and then threw out all the planets that were too small to detect and then asked if we would reproduce the pattern and that does not come close to reproducing the pattern. So, so this pattern is actually astrophysical. It's not based on our detection sensitivity. But that's, you know, that's a, a great question to ask. It took six months of my time to answer it, so I appreciate it. <laughs> One last question. Yes. That's a wonderful question. So that's actually my dream for the 30 meter telescope is that when we eventually get these images of planets, um, of thermal emission from planets, from the heat of planets glowing, what we can do then is design instruments that uh, will use a fiber to uh, point at the light from the planet and direct it into a spectrograph to measure the spectrum of the planet and detect absorption features from the planet due to elements in the atmospheres of the planets. And we could see um, the motion of these lines corresponding to winds on the planet. Uh, we would be able to see uh, variations from, um, you know, maybe like seasonal variations or something like this. Uh, if there are moons around the planet, if we're looking at Jupiters with moons, we could actually measure the Doppler shift of the lines of the planet due to the motion of the planet from being tugged by the little moons. It's actually easier to do that, maybe, than uh, what we're doing already in, in measuring the masses of planets around stars. So we could find exo-Galilean moons with the 30-meter telescope and measure, measure masses of, of planets that way, too. Okay, and with that, let's thank Dr. Weiss one last time.